Paying without cash is fast becoming the norm. I pay even tiny amounts with my card. It's just easier. It's becoming easier and easier. Will cash soon be a thing of the past? When I think about it, I pay more without cash than with. We cannot use cash money in Sweden anymore. Around the world, financial corporations, politicians and leading economists are working to do away with cash. I'd see a future where you will be able to hold uh, digital euro, digital dollars directly at the central bank. Who stands to profit from a world without money? And who will be the losers? Without Susanna Schlierer, many people would have problems getting their hands on money. Here in the so-called Swabian Alps, a rural part of southwest Germany, she drives out to villages that no longer have a bank or cash machine. When I started my training, the bank was still opening new branches. I never thought I would end up providing my customers with money and other banking services in this way. Her money van serves the outlying areas around the town of Heidenheim. She has specially assigned stops where she parks and then sets up shop. This bank on wheels provides the usual over-the-counter services. It has an ATM and a machine for printing bank statements. Many here are fed up that they have no bank in their area. That would be much better. Young people like me can use online banking, but I still need cash. There's no other option in this area anymore. There's nothing. This is probably just a temporary measure for the next few years. All the banks are closing down branches. It's happening more and more. They're forced to save money. Just a few kilometers away from Heidenheim is the town of Heldenfingen. The local bank closed here in 2017. And Heldenfingen is not served by a money van. Anyone needing cash here heads to a local inn called the Oxen. Oh, have they come at a bad time? How much do you need? 50 euros. Can't afford more. The manager uses his card reader to debit people's accounts and pay out cash to anyone who needs it. He set the limit at 200 euros. After all, he's not a bank, he says. Sometimes we go somewhere more discreet to pay out the money. It's up to the individual. Some people don't want others to see that they're taking out money. Cash on tap, so to speak. His customers certainly appreciate the service. I'd rather have physical money in my hands. That's right. You can get a watch now to pay for things or transfer money. It'll even give you a receipt. All this is just the beginning. A world without cash. In Sweden, that's now all but a reality. Whether you're buying a ticket for the tram or bus, a meal at a restaurant or cafe. Paying for the parking lot or even the public bathrooms. All you need is a card or mobile phone. We've come to a flea market in the center of Stockholm. There's the usual array of bargains. Most of them can be purchased for very little. 
But you soon notice that virtually every stand has a sign bearing mobile phone numbers and often a name too. If you find something you like, you just pull out your phone and swish. It's Sweden's very own mobile payment system. I'm for a couple of pounds for my sister, this one, and a dress, uh, 60 crowns for both. And you pay it with a mobile, right? Yes. You always pay with mobile or...? Uh, you... No card mostly, but like these occasions, it's really good to pay with Swish, yeah. So, how does Swish work? Basically, you just uh, need a person's phone number. So, you uh, type in the person's phone number and it will announce like who the person is that it belongs to. And then you will just get notified. Like, if somebody swishes me, I will get a notification that the money is in my account. Sweden's banks got together to launch the service as a joint initiative. The aim is to simplify payment and cut costs. I never use cash. From my view, if, if you can be complete without cash, I mean, that, I think that would be good. I hate having cash on me. They just disappear. If you have it in pockets, sometimes I even throw them in the garbage because I don't know where to put them. <laughs> where, where to put them. The prospect of cash disappearing completely doesn't bother most people here. Most of the cash that exists today they don't exist in physical money. So I think we are already there. And uh, when individuals stop using uh, physical money, that's just a very tiny, small step in this whole process which has been going on for a long time. There are dissenting voices, but they're the exception. I'm forced to it. We cannot use uh, cash money in Sweden anymore. At least very, very, very little because they take it away. So I have to use my card. I would like to choose for myself what I would use, like this. I don't want to use a card here because I don't know the people who work here and I feel not safe to use my cards, especially not my credit card. A world away from the big city, Lynn runs a gas station on one of Sweden's countless small islands. She still accepts both cards and cash. We would say I prefer the credit cards. We, we, we try to keep the cash amount as low as possible. We have this uh, safety box here, but there's also risk with the, the, the cash. Um, uh, but uh, uh, if I see as a merger, the expense on handling the cash is now higher than my credit card expenses. And, uh, so, so, yeah, I would say I prefer if they use a credit card. Once a week, Lynn counts up all her cash takings and fills out forms. The banks in her area have long stopped accepting cash. Every time she brings notes and coins to the bank, she has to make a special trip. Depositing her cash is inconvenient and expensive. But withdrawing cash is even worse. The bank charges her nearly 200 euros. A few times each year we, we need to, to, to take out change and it cost me last time about 2,000 crowns for, for, for just getting coins. Uh, and, I, and I get the amount I took out coins in isn't even the, the same amount of money. So it, it costs me quite a lot during a year. She drives more than half an hour to get to a place that accepts cash. It's basically a deposit box. For each bag of money, she pays a fee of 20 euros. So, not surprisingly, Lynn can hardly wait for cash to disappear. The main beneficiaries of this development are located on the other side of the Atlantic. Conventional credit card companies like Visa and MasterCard, but also new payment service providers like Google or Apple and Amazon. 
The online retailer has now opened a number of supermarkets without checkouts. Customers simply scan their phones at the entrance. After that, cameras track what items they select. Facial recognition technology allows the system to identify each customer and bill their credit card as they leave. A receipt for their purchases then appears in their Amazon Go app. No cash. It's a trend that's growing in popularity worldwide. Last year, Visa ran a campaign in which it offered 50 restaurants $10,000 each if they agreed to stop accepting cash. I don't know. Michael Ryan wasn't able to apply as his restaurant had already gone cashless. We're ready to go, and we don't serve it. I've been in this business a long time, and I feel like uh, there's a lot of theft when you have cash around. So when there's cash in the safe, downstairs, in the office, behind the counter, everyone's dipping in, everyone's sharing. You share your drawer with another employee, there's cash always goes missing. So it's just like a, this eliminated theft issue. So that's off, that's off the table. But the more importantly, it's like today I was late to work, the place can still open because they don't need to go to the safe, get cash, set up the store. He can just arrive and open up. So it's from an operational standpoint, it's a breeze. It's super, super easy. A world without cash is not the kind of world Brett Scott wants to see. He used to work as a financial broker, now he's a writer. He believes preserving the ability to pay with cash is vital. Cash doesn't have anybody who, to protect, to, to uh, advocate for it because it's, like, it's like a public utility. So you have on the one side these highly motivated commercial entities, and on the other, side, other hand you have cash who doesn't have anybody who Everybody uses it, but nobody it doesn't have an official spokesperson or no, it doesn't have a marketing department. Uh, so it's a kind of an unfair battle. He came over from Britain to attend a conference at Columbia University in New York. The question on the agenda here, is this the end of cash? They developed this concept of premature champagne. <laughs> the conference brought together a select group of financial experts from around the world. None of them believe cash stands much of a chance anymore. But Brett believes the current trend is a mistake. The best analogy to understand this is to think about cars versus bicycles. Um, if you're living in a world where there's only bicycles, actually maybe it would be a good thing to get a car. You can travel further, you can travel faster. But that's different to saying you want to get rid of the ability to use bicycles. Actually what you want is a world where you have different forms of transport. In a similar way, you want a world where you have different forms of payment. So sometimes in certain situations you can use cash, sometimes digital. But these guys are not calling for that. They're saying we want a world where there's only digital or in the transport analogy, only cars. You're only allowed to use cars. When he's traveling, Brett sometimes pays by card, but he mostly prefers to use cash. This machine does accept cash in theory, only right now it appears to be on strike. You might force me to use my, my bank account. You have to swipe it instead. It's going to send a message to my bank in England and tell a bunch of stuff to them. They're going to alter all their databases before I can get this thing here. So. And they're going to log this as well. They're able to see this. So now there's a third party who's going to watch what I'm doing. So but this machine's forcing me to do it. Finally, we got it. So what role does data play in the whole drive to go cashless? Germany at the University of Siegen, economic students are wondering how safe digital payment systems are. Could we become completely transparent just by doing our shopping? Where companies know everything about us. 
Every time I think, oh no, who will my data be passed on to now? It depends on what website you were on. But often things happen very fast and you've no choice. When I think about it, I pay more without cash than with. That's just the way things are moving somehow. We live in Europe, where we have strict data protection laws. So I tend to just be trusting and take the easy way out. There's also this aspect that everyone does it. You think it can't be that bad if it's so widespread. I think that's a key aspect. Right now, Germany is still very much a society that likes cash. But the example from Sweden shows how quickly things can change. It's an issue for two reasons. Firstly, because in many cases you have no choice, which takes some getting used to for people of my age. But secondly, it raises concern because we're losing an element of freedom here. We're allowing ourselves to be monitored. At the university canteen, students have always paid for their meals in cash. First they purchase a voucher, then they collect their food. But here too, things are changing. So you're paying cash. So, Students can now pay with an app on their smartphone. So you're paying with blue code? OK. You still have to check their plates to make sure you've got it right. And what you need to charge for. Hello. One hot pot, OK. Blue code? As long as they're ready, it's super fast. So what do the students think? It was super easy and it really saved time. But we were just saying we didn't notice how much it cost. The app doesn't show you that. The money's just deducted straight from your bank account. So I have to look at my bank app to double check how much I just paid. They might get rid of the person that sells the food vouchers. So there's a question of jobs. But OK, that's a separate issue. Contactless payment is not yet an issue in Susanna Schlierer's money van. She believes that's a good thing. Every day she sees how many older people already struggle with doing bank payments online or negotiating ATMs. Don't worry, take your time. It was because you made a mistake before that the card recorded it, but we've deleted that now, so it's OK. <laughs> I still need help. I don't like machines. I don't like using the machine. I don't trust it. Susanna Schlierer helps her customers where she can. A cashless society is inconceivable to many people here. The customers want cash. They just can't imagine going to the bakery or the local market and paying with their card. Obviously, there are pros and cons. But if the customers want cash, then I'll bring it to them. Back at the bank itself, in the town of Heidenheim, staff have to deal with huge amounts of coins and notes. The Germans may still love their cash, but the figures recorded by the banks tell a different story. Customers are drawing out less and less money. Meanwhile, the bank says the cost of keeping all the cash on hand is huge. These guys produce quite a few tons worth each year. They put together over 120,000 rolls of coins a year using our machines. My goodness, that's a lot. And that incurs costs which the bank can't cover through the fees that the customers pay. In our basement, where we keep the money, we generally have two employees working full-time. So personnel costs alone are around 100,000 euros a year. 
Then add the cost of materials, paper, the machine, electricity, maintenance, service costs. In theory, the rent for the room as well. Money is an expensive product. Overall, the cost to banks amounts to billions of euros each year. But that's not the only issue threatening the future of cash. The European Union is also playing its part, putting limits on cash payments and threatening to do away with large euro notes. Is cash fast becoming a museum piece? Not at all, says Germany's central bank. But the man in charge of cash management at the Bundesbank freely admits things are changing. There's a clear agenda going on here, and we mustn't be fooled by that. We're talking about a lot of money. Companies earn a lot from non-cash instruments like credit cards. People don't talk about that much. But they're happy to talk up the cost of cash. What they don't reveal is that non-cash payments also cost money. Credit card companies like Visa and MasterCard as well as online payment services like PayPal and the German company PayDirect, earn their money by charging fees for each transaction. In Germany alone, there are over 20 billion payment transactions a year by credit card or online payment service. It's a global gold mine yielding over a trillion euros a year. Kenneth Rogoff is a professor of economics at Harvard University and a former chief economist for the International Monetary Fund. He says having a cash system also aids crime and tax evasion. I think it's not that cash is bad, we should always have it, but large notes, the days when we need them are gone. And mostly they're not used for anything good, even in Germany. A lot of the businesses that only take cash, that's for a reason. They're you know, not paying all their taxes. People want to get payments in cash. They don't want to pay taxes. In some cases, don't want to have regulations. And I, I think the balance is shift where more and more of cash is used for that purpose and not so much for legal activities. Rogoff wants to see a world where there are only coins and small denomination bills for everyday use. Yeah. He believes all larger payments should be made electronically so they can be monitored. It should bother the government that they're printing these large bills and they don't know where they go. It should bother uh, U.S. regulators that many apartments in New York, Los Angeles, Miami sell for buckets of cash. I mean, really, is that because they're afraid of banks? Is that because, you know, they don't, uh, you know, want to go to the inconvenience of going to the bank and getting a, a check or doing electronic transfer? No, I, I think we all know why the payments were made in cash. And that's something we should make more difficult. As one of the world's leading economists, his arguments have global influence. In November 2016, India made a shock announcement. Overnight, the country's largest denomination bills ceased to be legal tender. Suddenly, around 85% of India's banknotes could no longer be used. Corruption and the black market are the biggest challenges facing our country. Since coming to power, we've done a lot to combat that. For days, there was chaos on the streets. Huge lines formed outside banks as panicked citizens sought to exchange their banknotes. What made it worse was that anyone wanting to change significant amounts was required to do so via a bank account, something that hundreds of millions of ordinary Indians didn't have. I can't get any money. The government is killing us with this program. I haven't slept for three days. You can't imagine the pressure I'm under. But the government initiative was certainly successful in one thing it forced many Indians to start using a credit card and various payment apps. 
One common argument is that it's a good thing that millions of people in poorer countries now have bank accounts and access to credit and digital payment systems. That's certainly the opinion of Tida Wald, head of an organization called the Better Than Cash Alliance. We're promoting the shift from cash to digital payments because we believe there are benefits for development, for well-being, to improve people's life by moving from cash to digital payments. He says the way things were done in India was perhaps not so ideal, but he still believes the direction is the right one. They have started a, a plan called Digital India, which means they're promoting the use of technology into government services. And all of those combines have created a great platform for government, local government, national government, for companies and for individuals to start being uh, more included in the economy. And being at the UN, we believe that we can be a neutral convener among governments, among companies, and among people to make sure that this shift is done in the best possible way. The Better Than Cash Alliance does indeed operate under the umbrella of the United Nations and works closely with international organizations. But is it really neutral and independent? Its members include companies like Visa and MasterCard, global corporations like H&M, Unilever and Gap. They're mainly interested in one thing, making a profit. The initiative is also supported by numerous governments and foundations, including that of Microsoft founder Bill Gates. The Better Than Cash Alliance wants to see people around the world living in cashless societies. Having the option to pay by card or mobile phone is a good thing. Brett Scott believes that too. But he has a bigger problem with movements like the Better Than Cash Alliance. Of course it's a good thing if you can have new options for payment and new ways to do things. So I have no problem with people getting digital payments methods when they've already when they've been forced to use cash before. But that's a very different thing to saying they shouldn't be allowed to use cash. All right. what, what I like is to have the option to use both of them. Um, but actually what a lot of these you know, people like the Better Than Cash Alliance and so on, they're not arguing that, that uh, they're not just saying that digital payment's a good thing. They're saying we, we should also get rid of cash. Brad Scott says that would mean we would only have one form of money in the future. The current system Essentially, you have two forms of money. One's the state money, which is cash. The other is bank money, which is private. All right? It's essentially commercial banks that issue private, private monies, as it were. We, we call it the same thing, but these are two forms of money. So not all money is the same. On the one hand, there's cash in the form of bills and coins. These are guaranteed by the currency's central bank. But most money, more than 80%, only exists in digital form as an electronic figure on our bank accounts. This money is created by banks during day-to-day -day transactions. In a world without cash, customers could no longer withdraw their money from the bank because it would only exist in electronic form. If the bank were to fail, customers could well lose their wealth. The cashless society is essentially a euphemism for saying a commercial bank payments society a private commercial bank payment society. That's what cash society means. So who would benefit most from a cashless society? That's what the students at Siegen University want to know. Today, they're listening to Norbert Hering. He's a business journalist who spent years studying the move to do away with cash. If you think of an extreme case where every time you pay for anything, even if it's just 50 cents, you use a payment app, you'd be flooded out with receipts. It would be quite difficult to check that everything had been booked correctly. Herring's big question is what happens to the data that we leave behind every time we pay for something? He believes it's outrageous that users are forced to sign a blanket agreement with each payment provider and then don't really know what happens to their data afterwards. I would only have a choice if I had an option of saying no. 
And then maybe I have to pay a fee of 10 or 20 euros a month in return. Then I have a choice, and it's my own fault if I sign up. But if I don't have that choice, it's do or die. So what do online payment services do with our data? To find out, the students take a look at the terms and conditions detailed on their websites. They begin with PayPal, the leading online payment system. The terms and conditions are super long. You can't really just glance over them and get an overview. In fact, it's almost impossible to read through it all unless you want to spend three hours finding out where your data is going to be sent. Yes, you get the impression that it's designed to make you click OK and carry on. Probably because there's information in there that isn't too good. What does PayPal know about its customers and how does the company use that information? At the German headquarters, the company director is keen to stress that PayPal adheres closely to European data protection laws. We share this data only as necessary for the transaction. So nobody just receives blanket data passed on by PayPal. It's always for a specific purpose related to the work that we do. The data doesn't remain with these service providers. It's only used for the one purpose. But that purpose is subject to interpretation and can mean many things, according to privacy advocates and consumer protection groups. The moment you agree that the provider can use your personal data for other purposes, then make no mistake, it will be used. And to stay with PayPal or online payment services, when you agree, you automatically agree to your data being used for advertising purposes as well. So it does get used for other purposes, not just the particular service that you use. Payment services like PayPal are looking to earn more than just the fees they charge. They want data. So they track their customers' behavior closely. PayPal's terms and conditions includes a list of third parties to whom personal data can be passed. It's over 40 pages long and includes some of the big data collection companies like Google or Axiom, but also Facebook and Oracle. Their one goal? personalized marketing. Alongside providing a payment service, where many people say you don't earn that much as a company, there are other business models that focus on this data. It's not yet clear exactly which business models those are, but it's mainly services and marketing activities. And perhaps we can't even imagine yet all the different ways that you can make money with data. PayPal is a U.S. company with headquarters in San Jose. It has around 230 million customers worldwide. So it presides over huge amounts of data. I mean, these companies don't tell people how they use it. This is an open question. I mean, I guess we don't know how Facebook uses data or how Google uses data. There's all these internal... And there's also different laws in different countries about how financial data can be used. Um, but certainly um, the, the question of when you combine different data sets together. So for example, Google and Apple are getting into the payments businesses or trying to get in there with say Apple Pay and stuff. And they already have all sorts of other data like location data, your search data. When you combine those data sets with payments data, you start to get this sort of three dimensional picture of somebody. If the data from our payment transactions can be used to create a perfect psychological and social profile of each one of us, what effect does that have? How does that influence our everyday lives and the way we live together in society? You're going to have these systems where people are actually aware that they're being watched, so they start to change their behavior because they're, they're concerned that their every small action has some implication. Um, if you think about, you know, 30 years ago, people didn't think that their every small action was going to be logged by some third party to be analyzed. 
Whereas now people are increasingly thinking, hey, if I do that, maybe, maybe it's going to impact my chances of something. So there's going to be all these like, psychological effects of being, um, having all your small interactions watched. China is almost there already. By 2020, the state aims to achieve near total surveillance with a nationwide network of cameras and facial recognition technology. Chinese internet companies like Alibaba and Tencent already analyze their customers' shopping habits and share the data with the state. Those who adhere to the government's way of thinking may get a better credit rating, for example, or a cheaper apartment. But those who don't cooperate get punished. The aim is for total state control. And in a cashless society, that could become a reality. We're seeing this issue within the, the, the broader frame of digital technology more generally, which is trying to monitor more and more things and bring more and more things that previously weren't monitored within the realm of formal monitoring. Um, and of course, that's always framed as being, you know, this is going to help, you know, people to get more services and so on and so on. Um, but of course, on the other hand, it's a new form of control. Could privacy soon be a thing of the past? Sweden is fast becoming a cashless society. The country is famous for its openness, and people here are surprisingly relaxed about privacy issues. A couple of years ago, there it was um, the sites uh, on, online where you can see where your neighbors are and your co-workers. And I mean, you, most of us are curious, curious so we, 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 we take a little peek. But we are also open with it. When we meet, we are able to discuss uh, our how we consume, what we earn. From the beginning, we are transparent uh, in our communication to each other. <laughs> in Sweden, we found very little concern that private data could be abused and certainly no worries about state control. For Lin's family, paying without money is normal. Children use both cash or, or credit cards. I can just go to my own children. I have three three sons, and the smallest one is now six, uh, and they have their own cards that they pay with. Uh, and either if they go to IKEA to buy a, a milk, they use the credit card, or here to buy ice cream. So we we see that the small ones use cards as well. Lynn is well aware that a cashless society means banks take on a huge amount of power. And that's a cause of concern to at least one institution in the Swedish capital, the central bank. It believes the move towards more electronic payments is positive, but also foresees potential challenges in eradicating cash completely. If cash would go away, and we tend to think about cash as being the uh, uh, last line of defense, so to speak, that if you can pay in no other way, you can still pay in cash. But if cash is not there and we experience some kind of uh, disturbance in the electronic uh, payment systems, how, how do we pay then? How can we get food, fuel, and these kind of things that we need in our daily life? There are still many questions surrounding the whole idea of a cashless society. As one of the guardians of Swedish financial stability, the central bank, or Riksbank, is busy weighing up its options. The Riksbank should possibly issue a digital means of um, payment, so, like a digital currency, and we call it the uh, e uh, This is something that would be completely new for a central bank to do, and there's no one that we can really watch and learn from, so we have to do all the footwork by ourselves, and we are just investigating yet to learn more about that option. So how would a digital currency issued by a central bank work? Take Germany's central bank, the Bundesbank. It issues euros in the form of coins and notes. In future, ordinary Germans might have an account directly with the Bundesbank. Unlike with a private bank, this money would continue to belong to the account holder, in theory making it as secure as cash. Or would it be better to retain a minimum supply of cash and have that written into law? 
For the students in Siegen, there's plenty to consider. Give it 10 or 15 years, and I think we won't be able to use cash hardly at all anymore. Not if things continue on their current trajectory. I think we're heading towards a totally monitored society where everyone will know that their lives are transparent and will act accordingly and try not to draw too much attention to themselves. What the future holds is not yet clear. What is clear, a world without any cash at all poses numerous risks. The main problems of cash in society are one, it creates a far more surveillance, so you create a, essentially a financial surveillance state. Two, it excludes a lot of people who can't get access to digital payment systems. Three, it opens you up to way more risks of cybersecurity, so massive cybersecurity risks. Um, four, it decreases the resilience of your payment systems. So, for example, cash has no central point of failure. You know, you can't bring it down, as it were. Um, where it's a digital payment systems, you can turn them off, literally. Um, and that point's important for stuff like, and politically it's important because um, one of the implications of cashlessness is the increased ability to essentially turn off people that you don't want to do things. So you can, it can be used for political repression as well. Back in Germany's rural southwest, Susanna Schlierer is heading home. How was her day? I enjoyed it. I had quite a few customers, and they were all satisfied. Her money van will continue to deliver cash to outlying regions, for now at least. As for the future, she's not sure either. I hope cash won't be abolished completely. I think it's important for people to still have the option of paying with cash for day-to-day -day shopping. But obviously it's possible. I can certainly imagine it happening, even though I hope it won't.